ladies and gentlemen, um, dear esteemed colleagues and friends. So it's a great honor to be here and uh, with you for the um, JESTA Summit 2024. And I'm excited to discuss with you uh, aspects of the transformative potential of neurotechnology, such as brain-computer interfaces, neuroimaging, but also disruptive new uh, brain simulation methods, and this all in the framework of um, brain disorders. So if you, I, I guess you're all aware of that brain disorders has a massive socioeconomic impact, um, and, um, and one can call them the epidemic of the 21st century. Just one example for stroke, so we have around uh, 10 million strokes per year worldwide, and around 100 million patients who suffer from long-term uh, impairments after a stroke. So this uh, makes it very clear that this has a large impact. And the same impact holds true also for disorders like depression, dementia, addiction, um, and others you, you can name, like traumatic brain injury. The symptoms of these disorders impact significantly on the daily life uh, of, the, of the patients, and, well, the ah, video doesn't work. Uh, Sorry for this. But um, I mean, the patient, what you would see here now, has a severe motor deficit, cognitive deficits, and motivational deficits, which are actually very strongly neglected, like apathy, and mood disorders, which impact on the daily life and also on the productivity of the, of the patients. So ideal case scenario would be we find one treatment for all patients within a disorder, or even better, for all patients with one symptom, even beyond uh, disorders. However, over the last 20 years, it became very, very clear that this one suits all uh, idea to treat a neurological or a psychiatric disorder doesn't work out, and uh, we need personalized treatments. This is, uh, or one reason for this is due to the heterogeneity, obviously, of the patients, but also of the heterogeneity in response to interventional uh, procedures and side effects. And I believe neurotechnology, like modern imaging, for example, or uh, brain stimulation, will help to address these challenges towards personalized um, uh, treatments and uh, personalized interventions. Two important pillars in terms of personalization, on the one hand, to be able to predict the trajectory, the course of a disorder, because then you can adjust the treatments to it, and then, on the other hand, also to develop the very personalized treatment. I want to I wanna give you two examples how technology can help there. It's very clear that the brain uh, works like a, a, a large, strongly connected network. And now we can uh, characterize and evaluate this network by modern technologies like uh, MRI. And you see here, for example, a structural connectome, which is from one individual patient. So we can characterize it, and we can characterize also the impact, for example, on a brain lesion after a stroke on this connectome. And then using this information and feed it and combine it with machine learning approaches, to determine whether a patient who has a change in this connectome in the early stage after a stroke will recover over the next month would be a clear step forward. And you can appreciate here, um, if you look on patients down here, they start in the acute phase with a massive impairment, all of them, but some of them, they so show a very strong improvement in the first uh, few months and the others they don't. And this is important information. Applying such machine learning approaches um, allowed in the cohort we studies to predict two weeks after the stroke whether a patient three months after the stroke will, re will recover or not recover with a, an accuracy of more than 90%, so which helps in a first step to stratify patients. Now, I think for every clinical um, neuroscientist, translational scientist, a, a big dream, a vision is to be able to neuromodulate the brain, ideally by external brain stimulation, and this idea, this has already been formulated more than 2,000 years ago. However, now, due to the better understanding of the brain and the development of, the, of technology, we are much closer, let's say, to the steps that we might be able to do this. One big, big challenge, nevertheless, is still that core area involved in cognitive uh, functions of us or in the physiology of neurological and psychiatric disorders like dementia, like Parkinson's disorders, are structures deep in the brain. And so far, we had only the opportunity to target this structure by invasive approaches. The most uh, classical is uh, uh, deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's patients or the basal ganglia 
or subnuclei of the basal ganglia are relevant and uh, you can only reach it by applying an electrode through the skull and through the brain deep in the structure. Despite the benefits of the stimulation, obviously there are also some limitations and probably challenges with in invasive uh, procedures. Obviously, you have to do a surgery with all potential side effects. But another aspect is that these approaches are also relatively costly and the accessibility for patients is to a certain degree also limited. So if you look in uh, developed countries like the US, Europe, China, only two to 4% of the Parkinson's patients have access to this uh, technology. So ideally we would have an additional technology which allows uh, to provide such interventions also to a much larger uh, cohort of patients. And to do this, ideally, such a, um, such a technology should be non-invasive. And now, in the last few years, there were two technologies coming up, two disruptive non-invasive technologies that allow to target deep brain structure. So on one hand, uh, transcranial focused ultrasound for neuromodulation, and the second technology is transcranial temporal interference electric stimulation. For this, I don't want to go in, in the details of the, of the methodological mechanism we can discuss later, but in principle, it's a very smart idea here. So you apply two electric currents here and there, and the effect of these currents works only where they interfere deep in the brain. So as I said, I, I will, we can discuss later in more detail the, the mechanisms, but this allowed to target the deep structure combine it with behavioral training if the deep, deep structure is relevant for this function. For example, the striatum is part of the basal ganglia for learning and memory, or if you think about the hippocampus and think about memory or spatial navigation. So now um, in the last years, we were able for the first time to apply this uh, type of modulation, of neuromodulation of deep brain structures in, in humans. And uh, to, to do this, we uh, let participants perform like a learning a piano sequence if you want, and we know that the striatum is strongly involved in this task. And then the hypothesis was, if we are able with this technique to stimulate the striatum, activity in the striatum should be enhanced, and this we determined online with fMRI, and at the same time you would uh, expect a behavioral improvement. And this was a, a, the case in this study, where we can show in several healthy cohorts that, uh, to achieve this improvement. This was very promising because our goal is rather translating to patients. And if you think about neurorehabilitation, the core feature of neurorehabilitation is relearning of a skill which get lost, right? So we have a technology which probably can enhance uh, learning and training. Um, and this is a core feature of rehabilitation. So the next step was to translate it in the very first proof of concept into a patient group with brain damage. So we used a group of patients suffering from traumatic brain injury and we let them uh, train the same, uh, the same training under stimulation. And what we could show there, that the training was significantly en enhanced and we could even achieve an effect which persistent, persisted for at least 24 hours after the stimulation. So um, taken together, this is a, a very promising aspect now, um, which we had here with a new opportunity to have uh, new treatment strategies for patients suffering from neurological and psychiatric disorders where these deep brain, brain structures like the striatum, the basal ganglia, thalamus, or hippocampus play a relevant uh, role. That's like stroke, dementia, epilepsy, um, apathy, and others. However, the point I think what is great to be here together is the problem from this first step of uh, clinical proof of concept to a real translation into clinical daily life is difficult, right? So there is needed to provide more clinical evidence with larger clinical trials, regulatory aspects, and then ideally we would like to develop such a, um, um, such a technology that patients can apply it at home under their own control remotely or AI controlled by the respective uh, neuroscientists. To do this, I think the only opportunity to do this fast and to translate it fast is that all stakeholders, reaching from researchers, clinicians, patients, but also funders and the people from regular uh, bodies, or probably health insurance, should come together and bring it forward. Um, despite, obviously, clinical translation, this technology can also be used for cognitive enhancement. It's probably another topic we could 
uh, discuss more in, uh, uh, offline. I have one example here where we stimulated basically the hippocampus while healthy subjects perform a spatial navigation task in virtual reality. What you can see is you can enhance basically the learning in this virtual maze and the spatial navigation is in it. But I guess that's a, a discussion uh, probably for later on. And by this, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. We have a, a little bit of time, just a little bit of time as I watch the countdown. So I'm going to pose a question. Mm -hmm. What we've already heard at the summit today is the need to balance anticipation with this rapid acceleration. Mm -hmm. At the same time we heard on the last panel the need to give scientists time and space. How do you triangulate those features to really bring forward innovations that we know, mm -hmm. as has been the case in biomedical advances, sometimes don't prove themselves to be worthy? Mm. Yeah, that's a, a very good and um, also complex question. I believe what is important that we collaborate, that different stakeholders come early on together on the table and try to develop in parallel, ideally, the clinical translation, but also develop the understanding of underlying mechanisms, but also develop the framework how we would like later on such a technology translate into clinical life. If we do all this step in a sequential way, and I think we know this from a lot of technologies, it takes very, very long um, to be then implemented and to reach really the patients. And the goal should be that we come with this translation very fast uh, to patients. There are a couple of aspects, obviously, which are complicated. So the one of you who, who are involved in clinical, in clinical research, there's always from clinicians or from traditionally the call for large clinical trials, which can on one hand only be funded by companies because they're very expensive. And if they are not designed in a personalized way, you need large amounts of patients, which takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money. And at the end, we end up, even if it's significant, that we realize, okay, this treatment fits for some of the patients, but not all of this. So in my view, we should change their, um, the strategy and go to very focused uh, treatment trials um, together with the respective stakeholders and then have a, a claim which probably doesn't translate for the whole population of the disorder, but for a specific one, and there we know it works. So thank you. It is that friction between incremental benefit, the commercial incentives, and the desire for so many people to look forward to recovery and enhancement from new technologies. So Professor Hummel, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you.